Welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Our co-hosts, Sri Rajagopalan and Peter V.S. Bond, explore how brands and retailers engage with consumers online, in-store, and everywhere in between. And now, here are Sri and Peter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. I am one of the aforementioned CPG Guys. My name is Peter V.S. Bond. I do this podcast as a side gig. The rest of the time, I am the Vice President of Retail Strategy at Power Reviews, a product rating and review software company. I'm usually joined by my co-host, Sri Rajagopalan, but Sri, as you've heard from prior episodes, is very busy launching his new D2C natural supplement business, Zen Fuel. And he has been very busy on the photo shoot set, getting images all done for his launch. So unfortunately, he can't join us today, but I'm going to do my best to cover for him. It is kind of sad because this is usually where I disabuse him of his love for the New York Yankees and their fact that all the players are already playing golf right now. So we'll just leave it at that. What I'm going to do instead is introduce our guest. Uh, he is uh, Flywheel Digital. He's the executive vice president. Both Sri and I know him. Sri in particular met him during his time at J&J. So I'm going to let our guest speak to us about that experience. So please join me in welcoming Alex McCord. Alex, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me on, Peter. Really appreciate it. So my condolences on having such a, uh, a relationship with Sri. Uh, hopefully you've, <laughs> you've been able to recover from it as as I have. I'm just teasing. Everybody loves Shri. But uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and, and sure. Flywheel Digital. Yeah, sure. So um, as you mentioned, I'm Executive Vice President here at Flywheel Digital. Um, you know, uh, have been with the company for about four years now. So you've been um, with the company four years. That's great. About four years now. But before that, uh, the co-founders and I were at a previous firm, which is where I met Shri um, back when we were working on the Johnson & Johnson business from the agency side. Uh, back in the day. So I've been in this space for about 10 years. And when I defined this space for me, um, that's really, you know, in the business of helping brands win on e-commerce platforms, you know, primarily focused on, on Amazon and other self-service platforms. Um, but Flywheel is uh, a service provider uh, that provides managed service, both in media services and retail services to help brands take sales, to take share, uh, and really just to, you know, punch above their weight uh, when they're you know, optimizing their sales on these e-commerce platforms. Great. I'll bumper this at both ends of our conversation, but if people want to learn more about your business, where should they go? Yeah, um, you just flywheeldigital.com uh, or flywheel on LinkedIn. Uh, either one will get you where you need to go. That is perfect. So that's really great. As you mentioned in your description, your career was kind of born into e-commerce and digital retailing when it was fairly nascent for CPG brands. I think back to my experience when it really started to occur to me, I think I was probably at Dunhumby in the, in the early 2000s and, mm -hmm. and uh, what have you. But uh, thinking, about, thinking about that, how hard has it been and, and what is the state of uh, maturity of digital in the CPG industry today, particularly given a very transformative 2020? Yeah, um, it's been a fun journey. Um, you know, I, I joke all the time that, you know, at the beginning of my career, uh, we were helping brands win on these e-commerce platforms uh, and they were doing, you know, $500 a month on Amazon. So the, the stakes were relatively low. Uh, the prioritization was relatively low. And, you know, there, there's always been a, a bit of fortunate timing um, with when we decided to do that back in the day. Um, yeah. And we've now watched that turn from a very nascent, you know, afterthought of a channel uh, into something that is now the key focus, right? Right? For most CPG manufacturers, this is what the board cares about. This is what the C level cares about. This is what the VP level cares about. And so, you know, a brand's ability to win or lose on these platforms has, you know, stakes that are significantly higher. Um, through the years, though, I think the the fun part has been just watching the industry evolve. Sometimes completely pushing the ball forward, and sometimes cyclically reverting back to you know what used to be. Um, you know, so the advent of Amazon or Walmart launching their own paid search platforms or just that pendulum switch between uh, or shift between profitability and growth that Amazon goes through back and forth and back and forth. Uh, you know, having lived that many times, it's always funny to, uh, to see the industry kind of react to whatever that newest change might be. Um, but where you look right now, I think what's the most exciting is just the fact that, um, you know, 
largely because of the pandemic, there's a lot of new cohorts that are shopping on e-retail platforms that weren't before. And particularly in, in older age demographics, um, the fact that folks are trying out uh, you know, Amazon for the first time or trying out Walmart online for the first time, those are really interesting you know, shifts that are not gonna go away. And so now you know, the expected stickiness is there. Um, the importance is there for uh, internal CPG manufacturers. And so I would say it's getting very mature very quickly. And you know, the, the, the industry saying, but it's like the winners and losers of the next you know, couple of decades will be determined by who's able to um, you know, optimize during this um, somewhat uh, chaotic time frame. Yeah, it's interesting to me, Alex, how certain retail channels and the packaged goods that supply to them have been slow to the game. Mm-hmm. No more obvious than, than grocery mm-hmm. that for many different reasons, they were not invested in it. Along came Instacart and offered a very affordable way for regional and super regional local retailers to get in the game without the kind of CapEx investment that big retailers did. So it is really interesting. I also say that from a from a brand and category perspective, there were a lot of categories that had, had sat back and said, I don't really need to be there. Uh, perishable in particular, mm-hmm. when perishable wasn't big delivery, but even alcohol, right? Uh, of course. Restricted. Nobody was doing that. And then along came Drizzly. So all of a sudden, everybody's at the table and they all need to do it really fast. Right now, I think most companies that are on a, on a calendar fiscal, so January is their new, they are scrambling, and you can probably mm-hmm. attest to this, to put a plan in place, get the budget, get the resources allocated, and hit January 1st uh, running to get themselves into a place where they are not only even in the game, but a lot of them really want to win. They want to win. Absolutely. Very interesting times. So I love the name of your company, Flywheel Digital. Thank you. I know what it means to me uh, coming from the space that you're in. Why don't you tell our audience what is the so-called flywheel of success in digital? Uh, Can you help break that down for our audience so that'll help them understand what that's about? Yeah, um, I also love the name. Uh, I was I was very happy when the co-founders picked the name. Uh, and, and really, the flywheel effect in, in e-commerce is the idea that um, the once you start to achieve a tenable sales velocity and you start to raise an organic search, then you become more discoverable for the next potential consumer. And it's the idea that if you do everything right, eventually there will become this point where you're able to start to unlock really exponential growth. And so, you know, at its core, it's that relationship between sales and relevancy. Um, and then, you know, those raises in organic search. Relevancy also has an effect in advertising, though, where the more relevant you are on these retail platforms, you know, essentially the less expensive it is to advertise it. Against those platforms. So that flywheel effect happens both in organic rank, but also within advertising. Um, and it's the, you know, the idea that um, you have theoretically unlimited potential if you're able to, to pull the right levers and drive that business forward. Interesting. Very good. 2020, very disruptive year. Mm-hmm. A lot of the attention went to Amazon and for good reason, right? And not necessarily for positively good reason. Sure. Issues around supply chain. I'm, I've am i been frustrated for up until a couple of weeks ago that I'm 10 miles from a fulfillment center and 45 miles from New York City and my prime delivery window is typically five to seven days. Very frustrating. And then the assortment. How have brands been embracing the need to move to digital during this period? And how have you been particularly advising brands to not just simply get in it and do everything, but to be very focused. What are you telling your brand clients? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I would say, you know, I think the brands have started to realize that this is important. That didn't happen just when the pandemic happened, though that happened, you know, decently before that. Um, and so it, it, the reason that I think there was initially that hesitation was just that Amazon and other e-retailers are significantly different, right? The supply chains are fundamentally incredibly different than traditional brick and mortar retail. Um, the digital shelf is very different than the visual, physical shelf. Uh, and the skill sets that somebody needs to be effective uh, when calling on uh, Amazon are fundamentally very different than what the skill sets might be uh, to call on a you know, traditional brick and mortar retailer. So I think that was always what caused that hesitation. Um, when we talk to brands now, I think, you know, if, if a brand is not fully bought in, a lot of 
our our push is around you know the the idea of you know the the time value of when you enter right the least expensive it's ever going to be um, to advertise or to promote on these retail platforms is yesterday um, you know the competition increases as more and more brands kind of wake up and you know auctions get more dense and, and competition gets fiercer um, a dollar that you, you that you spend you know four years ago would cost you, you know, 10x what it might now right obviously these are you know off the cuff numbers they're not necessarily meant to be yep. uh, realistic but the idea is name, just that name your chain um, to protect the innocent on this podcast yeah <laughs> the uh the yeah but the, the the idea that like any brand that that moves now um is saving themselves money in the future because they're they're moving and and adjusting to this as quickly as they can and i think you know supply chain is a key focus um and making sure that you're supply chain ready uh, when dealing with the retailers, um, it is fundamentally different than other, any other class of trade. And I would say that's a, a key differentiator between the brands that are there and the brands that are winning is how much they focus on supply chain, how strong their supply chain teams are, and how much they, they treat that as a growth driver and not just kind of a nuisance in the back end. Yeah, the more I hear brands getting involved in this, the more I understand that the first step on the process is to figure out your supply chain strategy. Because if you can't Absolutely. do that, nothing else is going to work. If you can't figure out how to get that product into the hands of the shopper, you're wasting your time on search and SEM and, and retail media and everything and copy and everything else. It's, it's all for naught if you can't get the product delivered, not just to the person, but in a timely manner based upon their expectations of the market. Absolutely. And I, I think too, it's just the, how, how does a, a manufacturer think about supply chain and prioritize supply chain within the sales function and within the marketing function, within the brand function? Do they have an equal seat at the table? Um, if they do, oftentimes that's a, a fantastic leading indicator for success. So when you consult your brands on both short and long-term strategy, I'm assuming it's based on a tremendous amount of insights that you source from all sorts of different areas. Can you talk to us about how at Flywheel Digital you're using insights and what sort of analytics do you provide to your clients to help them sure. make better business decisions as they go into this digital world? Sure. You know, in, in the short term, you know, think about ROAS, cost per acquisition, and all those KPIs that people expect to get from performance marketing. You know, the landscape right now is full of ad efficacy metrics that show the impact of a dollar spent today. But really unpacking long-term value uh, is where data science-driven analytics come into play. Um, and that's kind of what I'm most excited about right now, um, because this re it requires developing a strategy around driving business for decades to come instead of for days to come. So understanding the path to purchase, quantifying incrementality in sales that would not have happened otherwise, you know, analyzing the basket, predicting purchase orders, building repeat purchases, and modeling out all the different variables that drive organic sales are really important ways to quantify long-term growth within a category. You know, that's always the million dollar question with our clients. Um, fortunately for me, uh, Flywheel has got a, a really amazing data science team, um, you know, full of PhDs that are constantly working on building out these advanced models so that we can start to solve questions that are, you know, previously unknown. Um, but for me, that's the, the difference between short-term thinking and long-term thinking is, is essentially how do you build out incrementality and lifetime value in a way um, using the, the disparate data sources that you might have access to and putting really smart people behind them. Alex, you use terms that are making me geek geek out back to my Dunhumby days and my days at CVS. I love long-term value. I love personalization, propensity triggers, all of that, very important. We've come a long way from the days of buying mass media based upon the demographics of the viewership. So, and I'm glad that we've, we've moved beyond that. So I'm not gonna ask you to name names, but from the standpoint of the categories of clients that you work with on a brand perspective and also from the persona the role who who are the kinds of people that you're working with to help yeah. them on their on their digital journey yeah for us you know our, our portfolio spans a, a broad amount of categories but our legacy and our heritage is cpg which is why i'm so excited to, to talk to you today um what we're best at you know positioning within the market is 
we're really good at helping large matrix complex manufacturers with their digital transformation. You know, think roughly speaking, Fortune 500 type companies. That's where Fly was really good at because we cut our teeth, you know, way back in the day with Shree, um, uh, helping brands like Johnson & Johnson do this. And so uh, when you think about you know, the type of brand that's a good fit for us, the more complex, the better, uh, which is a little counterintuitive, um, but we're really comfortable, um, you know, in that environment. And when you think about who typically works with us, you know, our goal is to provide the background for success at every level of an organization. Okay. And so that means that we're interacting, you know, day to day with, uh, you know, the sales team that might call on Amazon or the brand team that might control the marketing budget for Amazon. But we're also interacting with the supply chain teams, with the leadership teams, with the the data analysts on the, on, the, uh, on the brand side with the, you know, the actual brand teams themselves when we're thinking about uh, content and the creative services that we offer. And so we're, we, we're proud of our ability to kind of be a chameleon and interact with all those different teams and tailor our model to make sure that we're supporting a brand wherever they are in that vendor life cycle and whatever's most important to them, you know, at that point in time. I have to imagine that if you were to assume a large brand would necessarily be 1P all the way with Amazon, you would be mistaken. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you confirm or deny that? It's a good question. Um, there certainly are hybrids out there, but Flywheel's been a little counter to the marketplace in this. And I, I, know, I know this is, is probably not what most have said, but um, we fundamentally do believe that, one, that large brands should tr primarily focus their efforts on building out their 1P presence. Because at the end of the day, we feel that that's what Amazon is going to want. They're going to want that direct relationship. And if you're a smaller brand, let's say maybe, you know, sub $10 million of sales on a year on the platform, then 3P is probably a better model. It ultimately gives you more flexibility. But if you are a Fortune 500, there are clever ways to avoid uh, all of the pain that can come with 1P. But ultimately, we were kind of proponents at Flywheel of doing the hard work to build a sustainable business on 1P because ultimately we do believe that that direct uh you know, relationship between Amazon and manufacturer is important and probably not going to go away in the long term. So let me just double click one second. Sure. I know it's, it's a little interesting for me here. If I'm a big brand and I've got a big assortment, but mm -hmm. honestly, when you look across my assortment, there are some core items that are clearly 1P worthy items. Mm -hmm. And there may be some niche products, but if I go to market on Amazon's platform, I want my whole portfolio represented. Is that a situation where, where they should be thinking about a matrix solution? Uh, that, it's a good question. It's definitely easier to ramp a new item uh, on the 3P side because you have more control over inventory, you've got more control over pricing. So there, there's certainly benefits to that. Um, but ultimately, you know, if we're working with a client, our, our main objective is to, to work with them to figure out, okay, how do we make sure that this assortment is sustainable? And sometimes that's things that are hard to execute, but simple to say, like building on a multi-pack or building out e-commerce assortment. It's obviously very difficult to do that, but um, it's a relatively simple concept. Um, so for us, we're working on, you know, packaging optimizations and an e-commerce ready assortment uh, and making sure that we're balancing the portfolio in the right way. Now, certain instances, that's going to be very difficult, right? It's like if you sell products with an ASP that are $2 or $3, this is going to be a tricky environment no matter what. Um, and, you know, matrix um, solutions probably have a, a bigger play there. But, um, you know, if you're a top thousand vendor, really our goal is to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make your 1P business sustainable both now and in the long term. I'm so fascinated by so many terms that have come to my attention over the last couple of years. I'm certainly immersing myself in ACOS, ROAS, everything else. Um, the one that's fascinated me lately is just virtual bundling and this mm -hmm. idea that you present it, but in the back behind the scenes, it's all being assembled and you are no, uh, none the wiser for what's going yep. on. You've got to imagine that's probably something you're seeing as well. Yeah, vir virtual bundling's uh, a fantastic uh, activation. The watch out there is just that uh, it's a great fit for brands that are always going to have significant volume within the right FCs within Amazon. Because from a consumer experience perspective, you need to have both of those products or three of those products or however many together at the same time. Um, and if they're not in the same FC, then you're ultimately not getting that value. So it's absolutely a great activation. We've had some really nice successes with that, um, particularly recently. Um, and you know, I, I wish we could expand it more on Amazon. It's just a matter of making sure that the logistics and supply chain match that front end and uh, consumer experience. 
so while, while Amazon is clearly a more mature marketplace mm -hmm. environment, there are challengers that are emerging. Walmart with Walmart Plus and Target with Target Plus. Wow, everybody's adding the plus sign on. I don't know what, <laughs> we need to work on some unique branding here, people. But in any event, what's the future? Are, are there going to be decided winners and there are others that just don't seem to get what needs to be done or, or have a frequency of purchase that really don't drive or lend credibility to this marketplace concept? What, what's going on with, with the rest of the, I, I talk to brands and the way I typically hear them talk is mm -hmm. here's my Amazon plan and here's my everything else. Plan. Sure. <laughs> what are your thoughts? On that? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a great question because if you had asked me that question, say two years ago, yeah. I would have, poo-pooed that anyone would be able to make any traction that's not Amazon. I've long been a believer that a this is a one horse race in, in America and Amazon from a US perspective, at least is, is not going to be caught. Um, I still think I still think Amazon is significantly ahead and they'll stay significantly ahead, but the battleground has started to shift here. If you think about you know Walmart Plus, the early indications are that the launch has been successful. Um, I know there was that article, I think in, uh, I can't remember what that publication was, that said it was 11% of the US population was signed up out of the gate. Uh, if that's true, that's obviously an astronomical amount. So that's fantastic. And I think where where they can, they being Walmart can, can really make some inroads is um, both in terms of services that Amazon can offer, i.e. discounts on gas, that means a lot, uh, particularly in more rural areas. Um, and then also just that coverage, that footprint of you know 90% of the US population is within 10 miles of a Walmart is something that at least in the current state, um, you know, pre any acquisition, Amazon can't match. And so what's really happened here is, is smart from the, the traditional Omni retailers, but they've moved the stakes towards um, leveraging you know the last mile putting the owners for the last mile back on the consumer which ultimately allows them to finally start to make some money here because the dirty secret is it's very very difficult to to ship particularly cpg products online but if you can get the consumer to come to you uh that becomes a different battleground so i do expect that you know, at least uh, from a Walmart perspective, they're going to make some inroads, uh, Target likely as well. And then I'm fascinated also by the the disintermediaries, um, you know, the Instacarts of the world um, have done a, a fantastic job, particularly during um, and after COVID hit to really pick up some significant market share there. And we're believers that that, that model has legs in the long run. Um, and so if you think about where does, where does Flywheel, you know, spend a lot of our, our mental energy, of course, it's Amazon, that's our history, that's our heritage. Uh, but going forward, Forward, Walmart and Instacart are really, really interesting to us. Um, we've seen some awesome success with our clients on those platforms. And I think while their strategies are both very different, they both do have legs as you think about the future here. Yeah, I would agree with you, particularly around Instacart. I think once consumers get completely accustomed to the service fee structure associated with understanding you're getting a massive convenience delivered to you and expecting that's going to be covered as part of a basic subscription is, and even when you do, Instacart obviously has its own subscription, but you're going to tip the drivers too. So once you understand that, the other end of the spectrum is obviously the home delivery that we've done. I, I've always believed it's there's a geographic barrier to this. The only place in the United States, not even Chicago, not LA, the only place in the United States where this can work at scale is in Manhattan. And the reason for that is when Fresh Direct drives up to a delivery, it doesn't just drop off one order, it drops off a pallet with 60 orders at that building. And then it drives one block and does another pallet. And so they spend most of their time actually breaking down and delivering products within the, within the door and not driving in between. And so to your point, until America understands and can completely embrace the click and collect, buy online, pick up a, at store or pick up at curb or pick up at a depot, yeah, I think there's going to be profit challenges associated. My favorite topic is content. It's because the business that I'm in, right? Sure. <laughs> Our reviews, we work with brands to generate authentic customer feedback. It's amazing that how people are willing to trust the opinions of other people that they've never met, have no idea where they live, much more so than they will any advertising or copy that has been provided to them by the actual brand that manufactured it. So I'm always amazed at that. So I think about a lot of different content. 
So can you talk to me about increasingly going from the physical shelf to the digital shelf? What is the role of content, both visual, textual, informational around things like health lifestyles? What is the role of, uh, of content? What really matters to, to, to get those glance views and actually close the transaction? Sure, sure. Um, you know, at this point, uh, having great content is pretty much table stakes for any brand that's worth their salt, right? And so uh, it, it's not a matter of saying, hey, you can't do this anymore. Everyone realizes, okay, we got to start to take this more seriously. At its core, the two things that we spend the most time focusing on in Flywheel, we do have a vertically integrated you know, studio, so we do a lot of content work. Um, mm -hmm. But the things that I felt always have found to have the most weight, uh, one is very basic, but it's just your product title reason for that is that it has a click impact um, based off attracting those clicks, particularly in mobile. It also has an advertising impact in terms of it carries the heaviest weight for your relevancy. And so making sure that your title is optimized and not just you know, keyword stuff to, to get to the degree, but actually optimized can help make you more efficient in advertising and can attract more clicks. And while that's not you know a sexy answer, that is uh, definitely still, for me, number one thing that I would focus on from an optimization perspective. To get more into the fun stuff, um, you know, alternate images and flywheel parlance P plus images, uh, yeah. that's, that's the really, really heavy hitting part. And the reason for that is that there's less, you know, formal rules and regs of what you can and can't do there, the way that a main image is, is, is more locked down. And particularly on mobile, most consumers are gonna swipe through all of those images before they make a purchase, uh, but they're not necessarily gonna go to all your below the fold content or scroll down and look and read all your bullets of your description. So that's you your use, best place to talk. Okay. You used a you used a great term. I want to educate our audience. It's sure. on the it's on our on our glossary of e commerce terms. Sure. Describe what because this this comes back to the old newspaper days. What is what does below the fold mean? Sure. Uh, above the fold, below the fold, uh, in its simplest term, above the fold, you don't have to scroll. You don't have to, to go down at all within the the um, the web page that you're looking at. It's just what you see when you get to the page. Below the fold would be when you have to scroll uh, scroll down to see some content. Thank you for that. Um, we're always <laughs> trying to make sure we educate. I will say this um, with respect to the image carousel and alternate images. There's some great work by the Baymart Institute. I'm sure you're familiar with who they are. They did a product page study in 2017, attitudinal. I think they tracked about 2,000 people. And while I'd love to say that the most important part of the product page was ratings and reviews, they told us, sorry, you're number two. The most important part of the page, to your point, is the image carousel at the top. In the absence of physically holding the product, that's where consumers go to under. And so when you have a hero image, that's nice, but a lot of people can't understand the scale of the product. Exactly. So having an alternate image that shows the relative size to something else that people are familiar with, yeah. great. Relaying um, both visual and, and textual content in the same image can also help convey mm -hmm. challenging things. The other thing I tell to most of my brands now that uh, around the use of ratings and reviews, don't let the fact that a retailer doesn't have a rating and review section stop you from sharing that content. Mm -hmm. Putting a five-star verbatim into a tile and putting it on, a, on an image carousel. Yeah, guess what? Walmart Grocery doesn't have ratings and reviews, but they do have an image carousel. Mm -hmm. So think about reapplying parts of the product page that are already there that don't require you to do anything. So I'm a I'm I'm right on on you with that. And, and to that point, the, I mean, where the the most fun for us comes is is we'll actually use um, our tools to mine the information from existing ratings and reviews for yeah. either the brand we're representing or their competitors, and try to figure out what's the semantic analysis, what are the purchase barriers, and then we build content that goes in the carousel that breaks down those purchase barriers before the consumer knows that they have that purchase barrier. And when we've done that, we've seen massive uplifts in conversion. And so it's kind of the mixture of ratings and reviews and using that as an inform towards what happens above. Um, you can have some really interesting unlocks there. There is an interest, I've talked about this in private previous episodes, but there was a really interesting study done in the last year by a professor at Northwestern and one at, at uh, MIT. And they hypothesized that Almost everything you could get from a focus group, you could get by just reading ratings and reviews on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So they did it and they, they did it across five or six categories. And all, what I'll do is I'll put a link to this in the, in the uh, notes of this podcast so people can find the article. But 
what they came back with was 96% of what you can get in a focus group you can get from just reading the reviews that people have already written. I mean, what a great capability. And that's why Absolutely. our reviews, we've been really focused on building those tools to just do all that automatically. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember talking with Shri when he was at, at Ravalon and I asked him how he was managing all the content that was out there. And he said to me, well, I just wait till the summer comes and I hire a couple of interns and I put them in a room with some computers. And I asked him to read a lot of reviews and come back to a presentation at the end of the year. And, he, and I said to him, is that scalable or, or even objective? And he said, no, invent me something that is and I'll buy it. <laughs> so so we're, we're getting there. We're getting, all of us are getting better at that. So hacking growth in e-commerce requires a real deep focus on numbers. We, I threw some of these metrics out earlier, mm -hmm. but um, what are the ones that you're focused on? And are you always focused on, like, are there some metrics that when you're launching a new product and you're trying to gain awareness, that you just tell a brand, do not focus on that metric. What 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 should they focus on most of the time? But sure. when they're innovating, what should they just stay away from because it's going to drive them crazy? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, you know, from a from a focus perspective, you, where we're always pushing, you know, the brands that we work with is when when you're thinking about from an advertising perspective your performance, you shouldn't just look at your ad attributed sales in a vacuum, right? If you're not having an impact to your overall sales velocity, then what are you doing, right? And yeah. so it's this idea of making sure that you get beyond just the ad attributed bubble towards looking at total top line and making sure that you're factoring that in when you factor success. That also allows you to tease out incrementality like we were talking before. Um, and then also to, to that end, you know, the idea of share, right? It's just understanding you know, what is happening to your business relative to competition um, it is super important. And um, you, know, you can obviously look at that at a scorecarding level, very high level, uh, or far more granular down to the ASIN level if you want to, to kind of dig in there. And that's what our team does a lot of is digging into those share numbers. Um, but ultimately, you know, we've been a, a long proponent and I think probably the earliest proponent of using share of voice as a leading indicator. And so, you know, within uh, both organic and within paid, yeah. you know, what's your win rate and, and what's the percent of time that your ads are, are surfacing, particularly for something like a new item launch, share of voice is going to be a far better leading indicator to success than your short-term ROAS is going to be. Um, because ultimately, you know, the, the unacknowledged secret of these retail platforms, particularly Amazon, is that clicks are still incredibly dense. You know, on average, it's something like 60% of clicks are on the first three items on any given term, which means that if a consumer goes and they search non-branded dog food, if you're not above the fold or in the top five or the top three, you're essentially invisible still. And so uh, using share of voice can really help to understand or help you understand, are you making the right investments? When a potential consumer comes to the site, are you actually you know, visible to them or are you completely out of the consideration set? And if you focus on those metrics first, um, you know, time and time again, you find that the actual sales output metrics come second. Um, but I think share of voice is an amazing leading indicator and the industry is starting to wake up to that a little bit, which is, which is good. Um, but I think that that's, it's probably the, the biggest misstep is focusing on metrics in a bubble as opposed to tying things together. Early in our conversation, we talked about supply chain is right. You mm -hmm. got to get that right. So let's, investigate that a little little deeper what specifically do they need to get what matters sure. from the supply chain that brands need to be focused on and how do you how do you manage walmart successfully rather than mm -hmm. they're managing you how do you do that what are the things that you just have to understand you need to address rather than just avoid yeah i mean Brands should really try, to so whatever degree they can, to look at supply chain not only as uh, a growth engine, but a great way to drive cost savings within their organization. Those brands that are innovative and attentive and, and willing to make improvements to, to cut down costs and drive efficiencies will continue to gain an edge, uh, both in the short term and the long term, as their competitors get bogged down. Really, that comes into five buckets of focus, um, first being forecasting. So uh, making sure you're understanding what ship to consumers and, and what the trends are there, uh, what purchase order forecasts you might have and, and what those trends are, as well as safety stock. Second is data integrity. Um, you know, Oftentimes, the root cause of a lot of the really nasty supply chain issues that folks have is just issues with PDPs and issues with new item setup. So making sure that the process are set up accurately so that you're not reducing your net sales with chargebacks. Um, yeah. Third is service level. So just making sure that, you know, orders are coming in on time. Fourth is packaging. Uh, and, you know, I get into this argument a lot, but uh, 
e-commerce packaging doesn't have to be pretty, right? It doesn't need to withstand multiple touches all, or it doesn't need to look good on the shelf. It just needs to be able to withstand multiple touches. So ugly core cardboard is totally fine uh, because your PDP really becomes that place that you sell. Um, logistically, you just want to focus on getting the product there. And then the last is process improvements. So just making sure that you're deep diving into, you know, understanding what those improvements could be. Yeah, that product may look great in the in the plastic clamshell when it's sitting on a shelf. <laughs> but when it comes to me in the fulfilled box and I end up cutting my hand because I'm trying to tear it open, I don't like it. I worked with with a major manufacturer analyzing all of their their ratings and reviews on Amazon. And what came became very clear to them right out of the gate was frustration-free packaging was their quickest, quickest route to success. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's very important. So, and, that's and I would say, go ahead. The, the last piece there is just the um, the importance of having a really good supply chain manager on your team that knows Amazon's you know vendor manual and operating guidelines inside and out. Right. If you have that role and that person, um, you can really deep dive opportunities and collaborate cross functionally and drive tons of efficiencies. Um, if you don't have that person, it's going to be tough sledding because it is tough sledding for pretty much everybody. We're really fortunate. We've got some, some awesome supply chain folks that sit on our side now. Um, but I do think that, you know, from an investment perspective to the conversation we were having earlier, it, it's part of the unacknowledged piece of, of what actually drives success. But you almost think about making that one of your most important priority hires is somebody that not only has supply chain jobs, but understands these retailers in particular and has proven success there uh, can, can have a, an enormous game changing impact into your fees, your efficiency, you know, your time to deliver and all of those metrics that matter. That's a perfect segue to my final question today, Alex. Sure. This is great. You gave some advice on having someone from supply chain. What other advice would you give to brands and retailers wanting to significantly advance their journey or on digital transformation? Sure. Look, I mean, this is not necessarily groundbreaking or novel. Um, I'm not the first person to say this, but you just be agile. Just be as agile as you can. When I look across all the brands that, that we've had the good fortune to work with, um, the ones that are the consistent winners are the ones that are able to both identify trends and opportunities you know, as they're happening or before they're happening, and then actually get their organization to move to action against those trends or opportunities you know, before their competitors can. You know, this can come to life in, in new product development, uh, in excellence within advertising you know, or optimizing towards a specific auction. Um, and then also just failing fast, right? Um, the brands that, that win here are not afraid to make those decisions very quickly. And all of that, you know, the, the general concept of be agile is much easier said than done. You know, it, it rings a little hollow just to, to dumb it down like that. Um, but agility and flexibility really are the two, you know, best leading indicators of, of brands that are ultimately the most successful on these platforms. And so, you know, when you can, uh, the internal battle that you should be fighting is, in my opinion, always pushing the org to enable faster decision making and enable fluidity and, and enable that flexibility. Uh, because if you can do that, then you can go, you know, run against and, and sprint against all the um, potential new opportunities that come to the table. You know, failing fast is great advice, Alex. I just remind everyone that I work with that you can fail 70% of the time and still make the Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> so really good advice. Let me remind all our listeners that if you would like to find our content, we have our audio podcast on over 15 platforms. We have a YouTube channel. We have a LinkedIn page and a community where we post everything, including a lot of third-party research. We have a wonderful e-commerce glossary of terms that our friend Adam Ware produced that we have a link to. We have some content from our recent profitability series. All of that is available just by going to cpgguys.com. Please go there and, and check it out. You're gonna find some great stuff. And of course, if you're walking around the house and you're looking to be entertained and educated at the same time, you have a virtual assistant. Well, all you have to do is ask her to play the CPG Guys podcast. We'll be right there in a second or two. So never mention her by name, Alex. Oh, almost did there because it'll set her off. And next thing you know, there'll be 30 or 40 different people around the country that all of a sudden are hearing uh, both the audio that they're listening to this on plus coming out of their, their virtual assistant. So uh, Alex McCord, thank you so much for joining us today. This was <laughs> a you. really interesting conversation. Can you remind everybody again, if they wanna learn more about Flywheel Digital, where they should go? 
Yeah, sure. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about Flywheel, uh, you know, flywheeldigital.com or Flywheel Digital on LinkedIn uh, is the best place to find us. Great. This was a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. And uh, I'm sure we're going to have some reason to talk to you in the coming year because we're going through a really transformative period and, and getting that feedback from people longitudinally is very important to us. So thank you again, Alex. So thank you for having us. Uh, really, really do appreciate the time uh, and uh, best of luck uh, as you go forward. Here. Yeah, thanks. And everybody, we appreciate you joining us for this episode. And we look forward to you joining us for the next episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Take care and have a great day.